up guys, it's Kayla and Jim and welcome back to another Meteorology Monday. What are we talking about in this video? <laughs> another exciting tornado case study. Recently we just did one on the 1999 Moore, Oklahoma tornado. Again, it encompassed more than just Moore, Oklahoma, but we did that case study. That was a yep. very, very interesting case study. Yeah. And now we're following it up with the 2013 Moore, Oklahoma tornado. And again, it encompasses a little bit more than Moore, Oklahoma, but we thought, you know what, let's take a look at this one too. And toward the end, we'll do a little bit of a comparison between the two as well. So we're going to talk about the overall general synopsis of how uh, the weather events are coming together to form with the storm system, and then we'll drill down specifically to that storm that produced the tornado itself. But before we get started, make sure you give this video a thumbs up and subscribe down below so you never miss another Meteorology Monday. It's free. Do it. Do it now. <laughs> As per usual, all the resources, videos, documents, papers, and everything that we're getting our synopsis and images from will be linked down in the description box if you guys want to check that out. So let's get into the synopsis of the overall event. A tornado outbreak occurred over Oklahoma during the afternoon and evening hours of May 20th, 2013. It was the last day of a three-day significant severe weather event occurring from May 18th to May 21st, 2013. In fact, it is called the tornado outbreak of May 18th to 21st of 2013, which affected parts of the Midwestern United States and lower Great Plains. This event also produced the most deadly and devastating tornado of the year for Oklahoma and the United States. On May 20th, 2013, a prominent central upper trough moved eastward toward the central United States with a lead upper low pivoting over the Dakotas and upper Midwest region. A southern stream shortwave trough and a moderately strong polar jet moved east-northeastward over the southern Rockies to the southern Great Plains and Ozarks area, with severe thunderstorms forming during the peak hours of heating. With the influence of moderately strong cyclonic flow aloft, the air mass was expected to become unstable across much of the southern Great Plains, Ozarks, and middle Mississippi Valley by the afternoon hours. Evidence of an unstable air mass included temperatures in the low to mid 80s degrees Fahrenheit or 27 to 30 degrees Celsius, dew points that ranged in the upper 60s in Fahrenheit or 20 degrees Celsius to the lower 70s Fahrenheit 20 to 22 degrees Celsius, and cape values ranging from 3500 to 5000 joules per kilogram, deep layer wind shear speeds of 40 to 50 knots or 46 to 58 miles per hour, enhanced storm structure and intensity. These were present ahead of a cold front extending from a surface low in the eastern Dakotas, southwestward to near the Kansas City area and western Oklahoma, and ahead of a dry line extending from southwest Oklahoma southward into northwestern and west central Texas. Outflow remnants from the previous night and the early day convection across the Ozarks and the middle Mississippi Valley were a factor in severe weather development with the most aggressive heating and destabilization on the western edge of this activity across the southern Great Plains and just ahead of the cold front. The National Weather Service office in Norman, Oklahoma had warned as early as May 15th that there would be a possibility of severe weather on May 20th. The most intense severe weather activity was expected to come across the southern Great Plains, specifically central Oklahoma, during the afternoon hours on that Monday. As such, the Storm Prediction Center issued a moderate risk of severe thunderstorms during the early morning hours of May 20th from southeastern Missouri to north central Texas. The degree of wind shear, moisture, and instability within the warm sector favored the development of supercells. Very large hail and tornadoes were both expected with these supercells, with the possibility of a few strong tornadoes. The Storm Prediction Center issued a tornado watch at 1.10 p.m. Central Daylight Time early that afternoon for the eastern two-thirds of Oklahoma, northwestern Arkansas, and portions of north-central Texas. Given the atmospheric parameters thought to be in place at the time, the Storm Prediction Center inadvertently underestimated the threat of tornadic activity that afternoon, indicating a 40% or moderate probability of two or more tornadoes and a 20% or low probability of one or more tornadoes reaching between EF2 and EF5 intensity within the watch area. 
So there we have this setup for the event. Something interesting to note again with this one, like we pointed out in the 1999 more Oklahoma tornado, is that SPC was not really calling for the size and strength of tornadoes that showed up this day. They called for a moderate risk and they did in fact start talking about this event five days earlier, but when it came down to it, they still only issued that moderate risk with a low probability of having an EF5 tornado or any tornado over the EF2. And compared to the 1999 case study that we did, it looked like in 1999 they were even more unprepared. So True. at least this go around they have that history to be able to look back on, see the parameters coming together similarly, and we'll get into that. Yeah, still kind of underestimating the event in terms of their morning forecast compared to 1999. Yeah, it just goes to show how difficult storms like this are to predict and the difference between, you know, that extra little bit of heating or that extra little bit of instability can change it from, you know, just a regular moderate severe weather day to the event that we're about to see. Now let's focus on the storm itself. By mid-afternoon, one of these storms developed near Chickasha and rapidly intensified. Around 2.56 p.m. Central Daylight Time, a tornado touched down about one half mile south of Oklahoma State Highway 37 in northwest Newcastle to the east of Rockwell Avenue. The tornado became violent within minutes. EF4 damage was observed soon after the tornado crossed State Highway 37. The tornado continued to expand in size as it approached the Canadian River. The tornado then moved into Cleveland County at 3.04 p.m. Central Daylight Time as it moved northeast across the Canadian River near U.S. Interstate Highway 44. Afterward, the tornado turned more east and then east-northeast after crossing I-44. Violent EF4 damage was again observed as it began to move into progressively higher density residential areas approaching May Avenue. The center of the large tornado path passed near Southwest 149th Street and Western Avenue. After crossing Western Avenue, numerous buildings were destroyed and horses killed at Orr Family Farm. Two storage tanks estimated to weigh approximately 10 tons were lifted from Orr Family Farm and landed about one half mile to the east. Moving east, the tornado destroyed much of Briarwood Elementary School, where the National Weather Service Storm Survey Team rated damage as EF5. Despite the destruction of this elementary school during school hours, no fatalities occurred in the school. As the tornado continued to move east and east-northeast, it moved through much more densely populated suburban neighborhoods of southwest Oklahoma City and more, where violent destruction was widespread. The width of EF4 and greater damage was up to 250 yards wide as the tornado moved through neighborhoods east of Western Avenue. The first two fatalities occurred in a house in the neighborhood just east of Briarwood Elementary, with another fatality in a house as the tornado approached Santa Fe Avenue. After crossing Santa Fe Avenue, the tornado moved through more suburban neighborhoods and toward Plaza Towers Elementary School. Damage to the school was extensive and seven children were killed when a wall collapsed at the school. Nine other people were killed in eight different neighborhood homes within one quarter of a mile of Plaza Towers Elementary, most occurring just south of the school. The tornado turned northeast as it approached Telephone Road, made a loop near the intersection of Telephone Road and 4th Street, then moved southeast crossing the interstate. Three people were killed when a convenience store along Telephone Road was destroyed. Crossing Telephone Road, the tornado inflicted significant damage to the Moore Medical Center, a post office, and numerous businesses along Telephone Road and U.S. Interstate Highway 35. Although the tornado was more narrow after crossing I-35, it continued to produce EF4 damage in neighborhoods east of the interstate as it curved east and then again east-northeast. One fatality occurred at a business just east of the interstate and one final fatality occurred in a home between Eastern Avenue and Bryant Avenue. Consistent EF4 damage continued until the tornado passed southeast 4th Street, just east of Bryant Avenue. Moving east from Bryant Avenue, the tornado continued to produce EF2 damage with isolated EF4 damage noted. The density of housing also decreased east of Bryant as the tornado moved east and east-northeast before dissipating at 3.35 p.m. Central Daylight Time east of Air Depot Boulevard. Overall, over 300 homes experienced EF4 to EF5 damage along the tornado path. After the storms occurred, 
Surveys were conducted by crews in the National Weather Service Norman and National Weather Service Tulsa forecast areas. They found that 15 tornadoes occurred during the afternoon and evening of May 20, 2013. Five tornadoes occurred in the National Weather Service Norman forecast area. Ten tornadoes occurred in the National Weather Service Tulsa forecast area. A rating of EF5 had been given to the tornado that affected the Newcastle, South Oklahoma City, and more areas. The tornado had a path length of approximately 14 miles and was on the ground for approximately 40 minutes from 2.56 p.m. to 3.35 p.m. Central Daylight Time. The maximum path width was roughly 1.1 miles. The highest wind speed was determined to be 210 miles per hour or 338 kilometers per hour. There were 24 fatalities directly associated with the storm and another two fatalities indirectly associated with the storm. There were 212 injuries. An estimated 1,150 homes were destroyed. Estimated damage was 2 billion US dollars. So now we're going to pop up a little table of comparisons between the 1999 F5 and the 2013 EF5. As you can see here, some of the most notable similarities are they both had a max width of about a mile. The 2013 one was 0.1 bigger, but still about a mile wide. The path of the tornadoes moved over pretty much the same spots, hitting the same towns, if just a little bit east or west. And damage for both tornadoes was at or above 1 billion US dollars. Some of the most notable differences between the two tornadoes is the 1999 tornado had a maximum wind speed of 301 miles per hour versus 210 miles per hour with the 2013 tornado. The 1999 tornado was on the ground for a total of 38 miles versus 14 miles for the 2013 tornado. The 1999 tornado was on the ground for a total of 85 minutes versus a total of 40 minutes for the 2013 tornado. With these differences, you can deduce that the number of deaths, injuries, and damage to homes is greater for the 1999 tornado. So from that table, you can see that the 1999 tornado ended up having more fatalities, more injuries compared to the 2013 one. Why might that be? Just comparing, you know, two different decades there. That's right, that's right. Some of it could be due to technology. Yeah, the technology back then compared to now is a lot different. Something major that changed was the rise of social media and being able to get alerts on a smartphone in 2013 compared to 1999, I'm sure that had a huge impact on getting warnings out to the public. Not only are you looking at a TV screen now or listening to a weather radio, now you also have a phone that you're carrying everywhere with you, people on Twitter and Facebook. I'm sure that was a very significant part of saving lives and preventing injuries with this storm. That's right, and the National Weather Service's modernization program started roughly around 1995. Mm -hmm. So when the 1999 tornado occurred, they were kind of working through all that modernization and, and maybe on, on the tail end of it, but in 2013, that modernization was in place Correct. and also yeah. allowed for technology such as social media to contribute to getting those warnings out. Yeah, so there's this kind of interesting comparison between the 74 super outbreak, the 99 tornado, and the 2013 tornado, whereas with the super outbreak, you did not have that modernization program. It kicked off the modernization program. We got halfway there by 99, and in 2013, it was able to save a lot of lives. Now, two sets of numbers that don't really compare are the damage cost. In 2013, the cost was well above what it was in 1999. What could contribute to that? Part of it could be that you had more people that moved into the area. So mm -hmm. you had more homes, you had more businesses, you had more infrastructure. And the path of the 2013 tornado moved over more densely populated areas in total. So although it was on the ground for half the amount of time mm -hmm. and more than half the amount of length, it caused almost twice as much damage because it hit more populated areas. It's an interesting case of you can have a stronger tornado, but if it hits a less populated area, the impact is significantly different. One example could be an EF5 out in the middle of an open field versus an EF3 that goes through a suburban neighborhood. Obviously, the EF3 is going to cause more damage right. because it's impacting more homes and etc. versus being out in an open field, even though the EF5 is much stronger than the EF3. 
right? And because the EF scale is a damage scale, it might not even get the rating that it deserves. Which kind of segues us into... I was just about to say! <laughs> another case study that we have coming up also in 2013, also in Oklahoma. What one could that be? Mm, three guesses to you guys. Okay, I think they know which one it is. <laughs> and if you're not sure which tornado that is, you'll have to check back to our channel. And the last fact about this 2013 tornado is that it is currently the last EF5 tornado to impact the United States as of filming this video today in April 2022. So there you have it, the 2013 Moore, Oklahoma EF5 tornado. Again, if you like what you saw, be sure to give this case study a thumbs up and subscribe down below so you never miss the next one. Follow us over on social media, Facebook and Instagram popping up here, as well as checking out our website and the School of Weather courses, which will be linked down below. Thanks again to you guys who suggested this case study and until next time I'm Kayla and I'm Jim. Thanks for watching and we'll see you at the next Meteorology Monday. Golly this pollen though. I've come this close <laughs> to like sneezing.